Thank you. It's my second lecture. And now in this uh, short talk, I will uh, uh, show you once more uh, which is the evidence on breastfeeding and which uh, could be the precautions for skin-to-skin uh, -skin contact uh, related to COVID-19. Uh, which is the evidence? Because the evidence is uh, lacking and I will uh, tell you how. This is my disclosure slide. This is the summary of the brief outline. We'll uh, start from a brief review of immunity in neonates and why breastfeeding is uh, such important. Uh, these are areas that uh, all of us know very well, but it's always useful to underline and update uh, this information. Then uh, we'll uh, take the point of the evidence existing about human milk and COVID-19. And finally, the same about uh, skin-to-skin -skin content and COVID-19. First of all, we need to remind that the first months of life are the most critical ones in, uh, in the life of a neonate and uh, an infant because the only protection from infectious disorders derives from maternal or externally provided antibodies. And maternal antibodies can be provided through a term delivery thanks to the transplacental passage, but mostly can be provided by breastfeeding. Duration of protection of inherited maternal antibodies can be precisely calculated and is 17 weeks. The more antibodies you receive, the higher you can be protected as a neonate, and in turn, infants who get infected, as an example by RSV, have received less maternal antibodies. Therefore, maternal vaccination in pregnancy might be a good option for some preventable diseases that might be very severe in the first weeks of life, such as influenza, pertussis, or RSV, RSV itself. And breastfeeding, therefore, is the current only possible solution to enable infants to receive robust intakes of antibodies and enable them to get defended. Keep in mind, and this was already shown in my previous talk, that hospitalization from bronchiolitis is strictly dependent on the breastfeeding with an inverse correlation. Uh, please note that babies breastfed can be protected by RSV, by severe RSV, also in the second semester of life, even though breastfeeding was stopped at six months. This means that the protection that we receive in the first months of life can span over the following months to a great extent. Also, I was already mentioning the lactoferrin included in human milk, but also supplemented externally or included in some specific formula milk, is able to protect infants in the second semester of life from respiratory infections. And we regard to COVID-19, this is even more interesting and I will show you later on why. So, which is the evidence about human milk and COVID-19? We know that COVID-19 uh, is questioned to be potentially passed from a lactating mother or mother to the infant through maternal milk. But the current answer is likely no. Is it, this is true and it's likely true because uh, Routinely, no positive breast milk samples have been found in different reported cohorts, but few exceptions. These few exceptions, one of them coming from a German report and one other coming from an Italian report that I will show you later on, these exceptions look actually being like exceptions and not routine the number of samples of human milk from COVID positive mothers that were negative overweigh by far the very limited number of samples that were positive. 
Therefore, in line with what above, we need to assume that the risk of a passage of COVID-19 through milk to the infant, thus determining COVID disease in the neonatal period, is very, very limited, if not actually existing. I was telling you about this very interesting study. This is in press in Frontier of Pediatrics and is a prospective multicenter observational study conducted in my town in Torino with the samples of human milk collected from 14 breastfeeding mothers who were positive for COVID-19. Search of viral RNA in human milk was performed by PCR. All neonates underwent a clinical follow-up during the first month of life or until the occurrence of two sequential negative swaps. The results are extremely interesting. 13 out of 14 cases were negative in, uh, as for regards to the search of COVID-19 in milk samples. Only in one case, the search was positive. All infants had a clinical outcome that was uneventful. All of them were breastfed, but one, and closely monitored in the first months of life. Four newborns, despite having uh, no COVID-19 in the milk, tested positive for COVID-19 and this occurred in the first 48 hours of life. Likely not attributable to human milk because it was negative. Therefore, we need to assume that the transmission of COVID-19 from this positive mother occurred horizontally through contact rather than through human milk. Please note also that the clinical course of these four infants who became positive was uneventful and all of them became negative within six weeks of life. Also the baby who received positive human milk had a uneventful course. Therefore, even though this case still is limited, it's only 14 maternal infant diets, I think that this is really strongly supporting the view that COVID-19 positive mothers can breastfeed because they do not expose their newborns to an additional risk of infection by breastfeeding. In line with this, we have another report published in the Journal of Human Lactation vouching conversely for a usefulness of breastfeeding in COVID-19 mothers and possibly COVID-19 infected babies. And this is because when we try to determine the uh, um, the existence of anti-COVID-19 IgA in the human milk samples, we have very interesting results because IgA specific for COVID-19 are actually there in human milk and could be, just like in this case that it's described here, a potent tool to contrast COVID-19 acquisition through human milk. So the two of these uh, studies not only show that breastfeeding is generally safe, but also show that breastfeeding could, should be recommended because provides measurable antibodies against COVID-19. In addition, I was mentioning lactoferrin already in my previous talk, and I want to briefly take again this point because lactoferrin in vitro, as I was telling you earlier on, 
can target and inhibit a proteoglycan heparin sulfate proteoglycan HSPG that is critical for cell entry by the virus. This proteoglycan links to the virus and carries the virus to the high affinity receptor that is the very famous AC2 that is uh, critical for cell entry. Therefore, we need to assume that the lactoferrin in a human milk or externally provided might actually interfere with the contact and the cell entry of coronaviruses in the cells by blocking one of the receptors of this virus. And this is extremely important. And as a matter of fact, a clinical trial in Italy has already initiated, has already begun in Rome, and we are very much looking forward to the results of this study. Thanks to this background evidence, all societies, but the Chinese one, ultimately agreed on the opportunity to recommend breastfeeding and not to separate, unless specific limited situations, the mother from the infant, even though the mother is positive. As you see here, this is a document that we updated one month ago, USA, European Union, including Italy and France and UK, Brazil and many other societies, all of them agreed on this point. Only a situation is excluded. When a mother has symptoms of severe COVID-19 infection and it's too sick to care for the newborn, then separation neonate mother is recommended and the use of express milk with no pasteurization is recommended. Please note also in this case it's not recommended to use formula milk. It is recommended to use expressed milk because in this way we limit the contact because the point is to limit the contact, not to avoid virtual transmission through the milk that is probably not existing. Let's go to skin-to-skin -skin contact. Uh, we published with uh, Professor Davanzo and Merwood an editorial in the American Journal of Perinatology last month Summarizing the existing evidence and the existing opinions, skin-to-skin skin skin contact after birth provides documented benefits on several areas, including breastfeeding enhancement, increased duration of breastfeeding, neonatal physiological well-being, and, and onset of a positive and good microbiome in the neonate. Since the evidence and the biological plausibility of a transmission through skin-to-skin -skin contact is lacking, at the moment we have no tools and no evidence to recommend or to discard something regarding skin-to-skin -skin contact. Not only since, please note this last sentence, since breastfeeding is recommended, why should we not recommend skin-to-skin -skin contact if the baby is placed at the nipple of the mother, uh, which is the difference compared with placing the baby on the skin of the mother? So no data support an increased risk of COVID-19 through skin contagion occurring during skin-to-skin. -skin. At the moment, we feel like uh, reinforcing and strengthening the recommendation of the WHO that skin-to-skin -skin contact be practiced, including also in offspring from positive COVID-19 mothers. 
this is the editorial and once more we uh, call we draw your attention on the possible inconsistency between prohibiting skin to skin where at the same time we recommend breastfeeding and as a matter of fact all main uh, worldwide neonatal societies uh, agree on that we are listing here a number of society for example the canadian or the spanish uh, besides those that we showed earlier on who actually recommend the only exception remain the chinese society but i would strongly caution all attendees to follow recommendation of the Chinese societies who are extremely rigid and probably tailored on a healthcare system that is totally different from our healthcare system, both in the Western world or also in the Gulf region. This is another and the final example of safe perinatal management of neonates born to COVID-19 positive mothers in Italy, including breastfeeding and skin-to-skin -skin contact practices. This is a series of a very numerous bunch of neonates and mothers who were born in Piacenza. Piacenza was and still is one of the epicenter of the COVID pandemic in Italy. Some uh, hundreds of pregnant women were tested and followed up and all newborns coming from positive mothers were tested, followed up, but at the same time allowed to have immediate bonding, permanent ruminin and direct breastfeeding. This practice was safe and after a few months from this practice that occurred in March and April, we can safely say that no negative outcomes were related to immediate bonding and skin-to-skin -skin contact nor to ruminin or breastfeeding. With this in mind, my take-home messages for this uh, brief overview is that COVID-19, once more, looks not associated with uh, clinical outcomes that can be worse in pregnancy or in the perinatal period compared to other ages or other patients. Some uncertainties remain pending, for example, about the possible higher rates of prematurity or intrauterine growth restriction, but this uh, does not affect the uh, core of the recommendations coming from this lecture. That is breastfeeding, skin-to-skin -skin contact and bonding after birth appear to be safe and even protective for the neonate once appropriate preventative measures to decrease the risk of uh, horizontal acquisition are adopted. Thank you very much once more for your attention. Thank you, Professor Manzoni, uh, uh, for a really great presentation and very informative. Uh, we will be open now for questions. Uh, I'm not sure how we're going to be receiving the questions. I hope I will get some guidance. Uh, but I'm sure Dr. Junaid will have the first question. So uh, go ahead, Dr. Junaid. Um, uh, Dr. Junaid, is there still mute uh, your uh, microphone? Okay, by the time Dr. Junaid prepares his question, uh, maybe I'll ask you Dr. Banzoni first question. Uh, now, you, you, as you mentioned, most of the uh, mothers are, even if they are COVID positive, they are asymptomatic. So uh, what should we do when we have to separate the baby and admit to an ICU for those babies? Uh, should we uh, isolate them and test them until they are negative and then we 
mix them with other babies or should we testing the mother and wait until she's negative and then we test the babies? What should we do? Yeah, so uh, uh, thanks for the question, Ayman. The, the point is to first understand and assess uh, which is the clinical picture of the mother. If the, the, the best possible solution is to keep the baby with the mother in rooming in, in a separate room, in an isolated room where the two of them stay together and uh, share their virus if, uh, if this needs to happen, but do not share this virus with others. The only situation in which this uh, possibility needs to be discarded is uh, when the mother is uh, severely affected by, by COVID-19 with, as an example, a, a severe pneumonia, fever, high fever. So in this uh, case, the mother is kept separated and the baby is isolated in an isolation room in the NICU with uh, staff, dedicated staff, and with uh, uh, pathways that are uh, specific for the baby till the mother recovers and or till the tests are negative. This is what we do and, and I think that this is based on common good sense plus evidence-based medicine. Okay, uh, so uh, I have uh, a couple of questions from the participants. Uh, first for uh, Dr. Uh, Eamon, uh, do you recommend delayed cord clamping in babies with congenital diaphragmatic hernia? Uh, there is, uh, I mean, we, we are following the AAP recommendation. The current recommendation is that uh, the exception for doing delayed cord clamping is that if you have a need for resuscitation. So for that, from that sense, uh, we don't do it, uh, but then I'm sure there's studies going on right now so looking at, for example, like, you know, intubating the babies uh, at the mother's side uh, without uh, cord, cutting the cord to give the benefit of the baby from the rebound from rehab attention. Uh, but uh, we, as our practice is no, we don't uh, do it at this time because AAP recommends only delay cord clamping for babies do not need resuscitation. Okay. Uh, for uh, Professor Manzuni, uh, there's a couple of questions about the discharge planning. That if the baby is uh, shedding uh, the virus for one month, so how we can tackle with that? So, Professor Manzuni, can you elaborate it? And there are three, four questions uh, with the same, uh, uh, same uh, concept. That, uh, yeah. yeah, I know. This is an issue. And uh, we need to track the COVID-19 statues uh, over the weeks. As a matter of fact, in Italy, we perform uh, swabs uh, to the neonate uh, at birth, at three days of life, at one week, at 14 days, and at one month of life, his tests remain positive. But if we have two consecutive negative tests, that's all, we uh, consider this baby as cleared from uh, positivity. Obviously, uh, our approach is that if the baby is uh, asymptomatic or sta and or stable, is, if he's doing well and if the mother is doing well, we do not keep the baby in the unit as a, uh, an admission waiting for negativity of the swab. We discard, discharge the baby, we send him home with the mother and uh, the Tests will be performed by uh, outpatient services that are connected with us over the following weeks. Okay, okay. Uh, there's uh, two more questions for uh, you and then two more questions for Dr. Eamon. The first question, uh, Dr. Manzoni, that what is the minimum precaution you recommend, uh, although you said in your, in your second talk, uh, uh, for the breastfeeding, if the mother is not symptomatic, Okay, and uh, is, but is the COVID positive? This is the first and the second one that if 
many times we don't know the status of the mother. So baby born to the, that mother, uh, we have to do the COVID uh, test for all of them or uh, be specific. So these two questions for you. Dr. Yeah. Uh, the first one, breastfeeding COVID-19 positive mother, she can breastfeed, breastfeed. she is uh, recommended to breastfeed, but she needs uh, first to clean her nipple uh, frequently. And second, I advise, I suggest to use a mask, a surgical mask to decrease aerosolization passage from the mother to the neonate, even though this is a, a, a little hard for mothers not to kiss their baby, but until positivity is there, this is something that can be recommendable and understandable. And um, the second was, uh, sorry, if I, can you remind me the second question? The, the second question is, uh, is, is about the, uh, how you will uh, consider that uh, all the babies who deliver with the mother, which we don't know ah, okay. the COVID is yes. So how yes. you uh, decide which baby you have to do it? Yeah, no, we, uh, we start from the mothers. So now it is uh, compulsory and it's uh, routinely done that the mothers delivering undergo a COVID test. So in a few hours, usually during labor, we know the COVID status of the mother. So we know very well already at birth how to manage the baby. If uh, we still don't know the result of the maternal test, we behave looking at the clinical picture rather than at positivity or negativity. If the mother is doing well and does not report significant close contact with positive patients and has no symptoms, we consider her negative until we do not receive a positive test. Okay, uh, Dr. Eman, there is a question uh, from the participant that what is the best time to do the CRP and follow up CRP in a suspected uh, neonatal sepsis? So uh, this study uh, looked at the value of CRP is an initial evaluation of late onset sepsis. So uh, there's still a uh, value of using CRP for the early onset sepsis. And uh, Professor Manzoni and I, in the last conference we got together in uh, Sharjah, there was a heated debate about the uh, CRP value. Is it yeah. above 10 we consider it abnormal? Is it uh, higher than this? Is it above three? So uh, this study is basically looked at the late onset sepsis. So late onset sepsis, what they say is that do not use the CRP value as an indication to start antibiotics. So if, uh, you know, for example, if it's, uh, if it's sensitivity is only 60% and you taking the CRP value as an indication to start or not to start, no, you have to start based on a clinical ground, not based on a CRP value. Uh, the other question, uh, Eamon, for you uh, from the participant that for the late onset sepsis, how you see uh, the utilization or to doing the procalcitonin instead of a CRP. Do you have any uh, comment on that? Yeah, if, if you have it available to your hospital, it's very good. Uh, it's really, it's, there's no established uh, cutoff for the babies in the first few days of life. But beyond that, uh, there's a value for procalcitonin if you have it. And uh, if it's available to you, it's uh, more sensitive than a CRP. Okay. Now, the, the last thing is that because uh, you showed that study, uh, PREMOT uh, trial 2. Uh, so, one of the participants said that there is a one study which uh, also published recently, uh, but uh, we, I, I don't have the reference. And he said that uh, he or she said that uh, they recommend still the cord milking. So, what, what, what is your practice in your unit? Okay, so we don't do cord milking uh, at any gestational age because there's not enough evidence to support the routine use as per an RP. 
NLS uh, showed that uh, there is a maybe some benefit to using uh, cord milking if in cases that need resuscitation. But either the NRP or the NLS, both of them saying that it really should not be the used under, you can touch about 29 weeks or 27 weeks, you'd be more careful uh, because of the risk of IVH. I think the risk of IVH is real for a small baby because it's a pulsatized flow when you do the cord milking. So if you want to use it for a, a full-term baby, uh, it's not recommended uh, routinely because there's not enough evidence. Uh, maybe in RP 2020, uh, maybe uh, Dr. Davis will update us on the new recommendation in that regard in the future and in the next uh, couple of days. Uh, but there's not enough uh, recommendation from the NRP. Okay. So the last question uh, for uh, Professor Manzuni again. Uh, is there any uh, cross reaction or the protection if we get the flu vaccine from the COVID? <laughs> well, uh, <laughs> we, of course, uh, there is no cross protection in, uh, um, I mean, uh, uh, in a literal uh, meaning. However, a very nice uh, study and a very nice editorial in the New England Journal of Medicine one month ago from uh, Professor Mantovan, uh, is uh, one of the leading uh, scientists uh, from the Italian health system. Um, he's an immunologist and uh, provided evidence and background information supporting the view that children may be more protected towards COVID-19 because they undergo frequent and routine vaccinations because their immune system would be trained to, re to react against pathogens. And this has a, a biological plausibility because uh, the interleukin pathways and the toll-like receptors uh, interaction might be already such efficaciously trained that they could react in a better way also to viruses or agents which have not been vaccinated for. So this is a very interesting theory that needs to be demonstrated in the real life, but pending this background evidence, I would, and I actually am strongly recommending vaccination for flu for all children, just like the Italian health system is doing, because this might provide a collateral positive effect. And uh, the extent of this effect is not measurable, but the, uh, the options behind that are in my, in my opinion, uh, solid enough to support this view.